We're going to read this morning a little bit about prayer and uh, talk about prayer a little bit. In um, in E.M. Bounds' book, The Complete Works on, on Prayer, which is an excellent book we have in the bookstore, uh, he said the following, How vast are the possibilities of prayer? How wide is its reach? What great things are accomplished by its divinely appointed means of grace? It lays its hand on Almighty God and moves Him to do what He would not otherwise do if prayer was not offered. It brings things to pass which would never otherwise occur. The story of prayer is the story of great achievements. Prayer is wonderful power placed by Almighty God in the hands of His saints, which may be used to accomplish great purposes and to achieve unusual results. Prayer reaches to everything. It takes in all things great and small which are promised by God to the children of men. The only limit to prayer are the promises of God and His ability to fulfill those promises. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. I, In reading this, as I said the other day, in reading this by uh, E.M. Bonds, it, I, I would think that he maybe was given to exaggeration. As a matter of fact, he says so many things about prayers. It just... It's a it's a it's a wonderful book because it's not long long chapters. It's like individual articles that he wrote throughout his lifetime put together in one book. But he so spe- he speaks so uh, magnificently about prayer, and he talks about how great it is and what you can accomplish. One would think that maybe he's exaggerating a little bit, until we then consider the words of Jesus, as as is the case in Matthew chapter seven, the great sermon on the mount, where he says, "Ask." 7-7, seven, seven, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him, or will he give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. We don't have to, we don't have to uh, manipulate people. We don't have to steal from people. We don't have to coerce people. We don't have to do that at all because our, our confidence and our faith and our trust is in Yahweh to provide for us. We have the instruction to ask, to seek, and to knock. And if we do, the promise of our Lord Jesus and the promise of our Father Almighty God is that we will receive and we will Find, and it will be opened unto us. I love the acronym that you get from those three, which is ASK. A, A, ASK, S, Seek, K, Knock. It would be something good to put on your window in your mirror, or in your mirror in the morning that you put that at the top in those three letters, that word, ASK, and so that it reminds you first thing in the morning to ask God, to seek of God, to knock. It's so so ridiculously simple, and it unleashes such an enormous power. I mean, could it be any simpler? My granddaughter slept over last night. She's three, is that right? Michael, where are you? Yeah, she's three, and uh, Zoe, and she's not aware of the time change. You know, that doesn't register as of yet, so... As uh, those of you with children that age, you you didn't gain an hour of sleep last night. <laughs> didn't help you at all. You just lost an hour, as I guess it's a word. Anyhow, Zoe was up very early, and I heard her making noise downstairs and crying a little bit. So I went down to get her, uh, thinking to rescue her parents, and brought her upstairs with me. I, I was sitting and contemplating what I was going to say this tonight, you know, reading 
this and contemplating what I was going to say to you this morning. And, um, and I carried her up and, and uh, held her for a while. And then later on the couch, and I sat in my chair and I started to read again. And then after a while, uh, as she started to... And I said, now, Zoe, I don't know what that means. Please use your words. And she said, she said, I said, Zoe, I, I don't know what that means. Please use your words a little bit more, a little better. I said, you want sauerkraut? Is that what you're saying? And she, she said, she smiled at me. And I, said, and I said, now tell me what you want. And she, she wasn't articulate. I said, well, you want ice cream and cake? And, you know, then she smiled even brighter. But after a while, she said, you know, I want mommy. And it was important for her to use her words to express clearly what she wanted, which was her mommy. And, you know, that's what God asked for us. He wants us to use our words. He wants us to be very specific, not to murmur and cry and carry on and pout not that any of you would do that, but you know somebody that is like that. And rather than carrying on and being all angry and all upset and all bent and crying, he wants you to use your words and to ask and to seek and to knock. And he promises. I mean, isn't this tremendous? God promises us that he will respond to that when he asks. As a matter of fact, he says to us, you guys who are parents, you're evil. I'm not. And you respond by giving your children good things. You don't give them snakes when they ask you for something. You don't give them a scorpion. You give them the best you can give. And I'm going to do the same for you, if not better, because I don't have any evil. I'm just holy, holy, holy. I mean, holy moly, what, an, what a promise that God makes to us. Ask, ask, seek. And knock. This would be good to maybe get some buttons and we could wear them and put them on our, on our, uh, whatever you put buttons on. And uh, look at Matthew chapter 22, or 21. Bumper stickers and ask. And you could go out into the community with your button and people say, what's that mean? And then you can tell them, well, Jesus said that, and then you can witness to them. And you tell them how great our God is, how wonderful He is, and how willing He is to answer our prayers. In Matthew 21, this is an incredible record. Towards the end of the, the Lord's life, something you're probably familiar with, this is towards the end of His life. He's preparing the disciples for life without Him. And uh, He's just cleaned out the temple. He's had that issue there. And in uh, 21.18, it says, Now in the morning when He was returning from the city, He became hungry. And seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, his disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt but will not only do you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, "Be thou taken up and cast into the sea," it will happen. All things that you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Obviously, when Jesus said this, there's a mountain there. He, I don't know what mountain he was by. Well, maybe he was in Jerusalem, right? It was it was a mountain right. There's a couple of mountains right there. He says to them. Uh, this thing about the mountain. If you don't doubt, if you pray, you can cast the mountain into the sea. Obviously, that is hyperbole. You know, hyperbole means exaggeration. But there is no exaggerating what happened with the fig tree. I mean, what was it, Jesus? Did he have a mood? Was he angry? Was Jesus upset? And he decided to curse the fig tree, as it says in the other Gospels? That's it. Jesus was in a snippy mood. He couldn't get those eaty things that Jay's giving out. And uh, he got all upset, so he, he cursed the fig tree. I mean, what did he curse the fig tree for? To teach them. And there's nothing, there's no exaggeration in that. The fig tree dried up. 
There is no hyperbole there. It is literally what happened. And he said to them, he did this for an example to show them the power of prayer. Wow. There's a lot to prayer. How powerful is it? Now, I don't, I don't know of any place in the Bible where anybody cursed a mountain and threw it into the sea. I haven't, and I don't know of anybody in my life that has done that. Although, I have, and you have too, if you've been around for any length of time, there's been some mountains in our lives that we've prayed and they have been cast into the sea. Now, of course, my mountain to you might be a grain of sand. It doesn't matter. It's my mountain. It's not your mountain. It's my mountain. And your mountain is not, you know, to me, be little, but it's your mountain. And the fact is, if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, he says he will respond and he will answer our prayer if we have faith and do not doubt. We have good reason not to doubt and to have faith. We have the, if you've been around for any length of time, you've proven this. You've asked for prayers. They've been answered. Or if you've read the Bible, there's so many places in the Bible that indicate to us how our God will answer prayers. Look at John chapter 14. That, that record of, of Elijah in the time when when Israel, all of them were worshiping, Ahab, in the time of Ahab, they were all worshiping the false god. They were worshiping Baal. And he had this stand against the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal. And uh, he prayed, I, obviously, that there was a connection between him and God was working with him. But he prayed that, for, that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. You're familiar with this record, most of you. It didn't pray for three and a half years. And, okay, that's, wow. But that, that, that incident is held up to us in the book of James where it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In the context of talking about this, not reigning for three and a half years. How powerful is prayer? How big is prayer? Now, you know, when you hear a teaching like this, usually... You, you might sense a little uh, condemnation or a little frustration to think that you forgot how important and powerful prayer is. Well, let's get over that. that you pray right now for God to take that stupid thought away because that's not going to help you. You know, there's, there's no, no, no value in that. Let's just, God, help us to understand right now. Let's pray right now. Let's ask God right now. Help us to grasp hold of the significance and the greatness of prayer. Let it not just be, let right now work in my heart to embrace this so that I can understand and that I can leave this morning and be more mindful to pray and more aware of you in our lives. At the Last Supper, when Jesus was again teaching on prayer, in John 14, verse 12, He says, "Um, Truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever believes in Me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, it's, it's not without this thing about prayer. It's not without boundaries. Obviously, that you know, in the, there's a context of Jesus' statements here. But I don't really want to focus too much on that. I mean, as a Christian a believer, as a disciple, we understand that it's, it, we should be living godly lives and holy lives and we should be obeying the commandments. And that if we're not, if we're rejecting God and we're out in left field and we're not doing the things of God, the probability of God answering our prayers about mounting casting is not too probable. There is a prayer that if that is your state, if that's where you are, if you're all the way over here, away from God, there is a prayer that I can assure you that He will answer and He'll answer immediately. It's a prayer of repentance. Oh God, I'm sorry. I'm out in left field. I'm in darkness. I've walked away from you. Please forgive me and bring me home. It's a prayer I've prayed so often that I'm so confident that He will respond to because I'm standing in front of you now because He's answered that prayer for me over and over and over again. And He'll do it for you. Anytime you pray that prayer in your life, He'll pray. And then you come back in and you walk in the light, you obey the commandments, and you pray, you ask, you seek, you knock, and God responds. That's how good our God is. He's so great. He's so wonderful. He tells us this is ours to pray. Look at... uh, 
John 16. We are, we're at a, such a crucial time in, in our lives as far as a people go. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe a very crucial time in, in our history with the elections coming up and the things that are going on in our nation. The way our country has gone astray from the principles of God and from the things of God. And we've, we've walked away from it. And, and, uh, where it seems so dark and so hopeless and so out of control, I can't help but to think of the things that I've read in the Scriptures where men, a man, one man, a man of determination and commitment turns his heart to God and prays for a nation and a people and God does a great work. He does a mighty work. And why, why can't I embrace that thought and pray about our country that God would work in the people of this country to turn their hearts and their lives to Him? And to repent from wickedness and to embrace truth and to, and to, to, you know, want the things of Yahweh back in their life. I think of Abraham when he prayed to God, God, if there are 50 righteous, will you save this wicked city of Sodom? Yeah. If there are 45, yeah, I'll save it. If there are 40, yes, I'll save it for 40. If there are 30, I'll save it for 30. Oh, Lord, one, let me ask you one more time. If there's 20, will you save it for 20? This is a prayer that Abraham is having for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around there. And God said, yes, if you find in all those cities ten men that are righteous, I will save it. And then God said, that's enough of that, Abraham. (laughs) Enough prayer time. Go do something else. (laughs) And what happened? The cities were destroyed. There was a righteous man in those cities. And God saved him. He brought him out. His name was Lot. There was no righteous that was destroyed with the city. He was brought out. All the rest of it, all of the rest of them weren't righteous. In our nation, I've got to believe there's more than one Lot. That maybe there are 10, 30, 40, 50. For that he would save. Why not think that our God can turn things around? If we, we the people of God, pray and ask, pray beyond yourself and beyond your family, and beyond this church, that it would extend further beyond that to the, to the whole of our country, and that our people would repent and turn to God and seek the things of God. If one atheist can have such impact, how about one believer with determination and commitment that is faithful in asking God and seeking God and knocking like Abraham did? Not only our lives, but the lives of others. Why can't there be a spiritual revival? Why don't we say no? Why don't we say yes? Why don't we look at the light instead of dwell upon the darkness in our lives? In our, you know, why not? I know men who have said, I don't know how that goes. Uh, John, that was a poem. John uh, 16, 23. In the day you will not question me about anything. Truly, the day that Jesus would ascend, that he would leave. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. What do you think? Jesus is playing? He's just tempting us? He's exaggerating. He didn't really mean it. All of that is wicked thoughts and words. It's not true. Jesus meant what he said, and he said what he meant. He said if we ask in the Father in his name, that God will respond. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, he will give it to you. Until now, you haven't asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, and the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come forth from the Father. We have this connection with God that is now available to us because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross and that we can pray in the name of Jesus Christ and God will hear our, hear our prayers. As a matter of fact, we know from the book of Revelation that God is very uh, much blessed by our prayers and that our prayers are heard by him and that they're, they're, they're embraced by him. Look at Luke chapter 18, please. 
Luke 18, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and to not lose heart. That's really the issue, folks. We don't want to lose our heart when it comes to prayer. We get faint. We forget. We get distracted. The world pulls us away from it. We forget the significance and the power of prayer. We lose heart. Jesus has given us a little parable not to lose heart here, not to lose heart. In a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God, and he had no respect of men. This is not a good judge. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God, and I don't like people either, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. I mean, we can relate to that, right? Jesus is great. What a wonderful teacher. So he wants to teach people the importance of not fainting, being persistent, staying after it, don't give up. It's just like this widow. You know, and we all know how these, I'm not going to go there, how persistent people can be when they want something. How's that? We all know how persistent people can be, especially if they feel there's an injustice. That's what this is about. This widow feels like somebody put it to her, and she is not letting it go until she gets justice. And this guy says, you know, I don't like God, and I don't like people, but I don't like this woman bothering me either, so I'm going to respond to it. <laughs> And the Lord said, hereafter, what the righteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? When Jesus comes, is he going to find people who have been faithfully, persistently praying and seeking the help of God? Or will he not? Will he find that person in you? Will he find that person in me? It's a great, it's a tremendous record. And I I, I can't help but to think about Jesus himself on the cross, someone that had not done anything wrong. There was no wickedness or injustice. He never did. He never stole. He never lied. He never did anything wrong. And yet he's crucified on a cross. The worst punishment that can be given to a criminal. He's an innocent man. And yet he is going through all of this. The torture and the suffering and the things of the cross. And he says to God in that moment, forgive them for they know not what they do. He surrendered it all to God, knowing that God judges righteously. Rather than seeking vindictiveness or bitterness or vengeance and all the rest, he knew that God judges righteously. He knew what the Bible said about God's righteous judgment and how it would come out in the end. And he was content to pray to God and to let the thing go. What a great example of prayer. And that's what this is. This is what we're talking about here with the widow. It was an issue of injustice. And she was persistent in getting the justice. And God's saying, look, pray. The Lord's teaching us, pray. Don't bring, don't, don't get all lost in, in, in this world and going about trying to, just pray. I will take care of things in the end. I, I, I love what it says in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2, it says, Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Talking specifically to the Messiah. Talking to Jesus. He says to Jesus, you ask of me and I will give you the kingdom. I will give you the power. I'm sure Jesus asked, but he has not yet received. He is not now the king here on earth. He is not... He is not ruling the earth as He will in the future. He's asked the prayer, but the prayer has not yet been answered. The promise of it being answered is. And many times when we pray, the answer isn't there. We need to wait. I mean, Jesus is waiting. This is going on 2,000 years, and that prayer has not yet been answered. But I have no doubt at all that that prayer will be answered. That prayer is going to be answered. Because He asked, and it will be answered. Jesus asked. That's why he walked so perfectly. Because he asked all the time. He sought and he knocked. The same thing with us. As we do that, then God can respond. And, and there, you know, don't, get, don't get distracted when your prayers don't get answered right away. Sometimes 
you know, there's, there's a whole big thing here with prayer. There's some prayers that you get, you ask, you ask God for help when it's just about you, about your state of mind, where you're at in your life. You pray to God and you're really fervent in that prayer. You're real with it. That He'll respond immediately. I mean, that's my experience. Time and again, when I, when I've been astray, I ask for forgiveness and there, there is that reconciliation that I enjoy with God right away. Cause it, you know, it says in, in, uh, in John, it says that if you confess your sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I, I have experienced that so many times in my life. It says to confess. doesn't say to generalize. It says be specific. Confess your sin. Lord, this is what I've done wrong. This is what I've done wrong. Please forgive me. And he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll clean you out. Okay, so I know, and you know, if, you, if you've been around for a while, you know that that prayer is answered often. Well, there's a lot of other prayers that I don't see the immediate result in. Especially prayers like I'm talking about praying for our country. Maybe we don't see a turnaround tomorrow. But I want to tell you something. I, and I, maybe we don't see it next week. Maybe we don't see it next year. I don't know how long it takes. I don't know if, I don't know if it ever turns out the way that I think it should turn out. But I do know this, that my God hears my prayers. And that my God promises to answer my prayers. It might not be answered the way I think it should be answered. I might not know the answer. But I know that when I pray, God will respond to my prayers. If nothing else, the peace in my own heart that I'm surrendering it to God. Or the, comp, or, or the, or the feeling of satisfaction that I'm doing the will of God in carrying out His command for me to pray is enough. But I think it's far greater than that. And I can't calculate this whole thing with prayer. I can't do that and, and stay faithful in it. Because there's sometimes when I pray, I don't see the answers right away. There's things I've prayed for for... I, I have a thing that just popped in my mind. I've been praying for it for 35 years. It still hasn't come to pass. For 35 years, but there's been a lot that's come to pass in my heart for those things that I've prayed for. But it doesn't... It, you just keep on doing it. You just keep on praying. You don't give up. Then there's things that I've prayed for. Hardly before I get done with the words, they're answered. Just be persistent. Don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. Be like that widow. Not that you have to annoy God. That's not the point of the, of the thing. The, the, the point isn't... <laughs> that's not the, the point is the persistence. Okay? Look at uh, verse 11. Oh, and, you know, there's the other prayers that we have difficulty in, 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 in um, prayers for other people. You know, we all have other people in our lives that we pray for. We have family members that we pray for, or friends or associates or schoolmates or, or, or people at work, people we pray for. We should be praying for a lot of people. We should be, there's a lot of people that we should all be praying for all the time. And, and you know, it's like, you know, I've been praying for you for a long time. I mean, it's about time you changed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm really getting tired of praying for you. No, no, no. It's not quite the yet, right? Because I can't. I can pray for Jim, and Lord knows Jim needs. Well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I can pray for Jim, but I and but God's not going to violate Jim's free will. It might because I'm praying for him. I mean, I pray, and and Jim has his, he's he's set that he's going to do it his way, and whatever this way is the thing you know is hurting him. Okay, well, I, I pray for him. I pray for him, and he doesn't want to change. So does that mean I'm wasting my time praying for him? Where would Jim's life be if I wasn't praying for him? How much worse would it be? How much is God's invention, intervention into that situation? How much of God's covering? I have no way of knowing. I believe that God says make intercession for your brothers. And that's the end of it. What he does with that prayer, God wants us to partner with him. I mean, that's the thing. He really... We really can move the hand of God that moves the hand of man when we pray. That's another E.M. Bounds thing. We can move the hand of God that moves the hand of people when we pray. Yet God isn't going to violate free will. God isn't going to be unjust. He's going to keep within all the parameters of what he's put upon himself. But he will respond to our prayers. Let's not calculate. Let's have faith in the prayers of God that we don't have to see the results. We just need to know that we're praying and that God will take care of the things for us. And good God, we all need each other's prayers. 
Everybody that you know needs prayer. Is there anybody that you met that doesn't need prayer? Well, that guy has got, I got to meet that guy. He's the biggest con in the world. If he's got you convinced he doesn't need prayer. He really needs prayer. Well, you need prayer because you're stupid for not knowing that everybody needs prayer. Wait, wait a minute. That's not the right thing to say, Vince. Luke 18. And he also told them this parable that some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed... And I see Priscilla's upset she's leaving because I said she's stupid. Uh, and trusted themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. And these two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I'm not a swindler. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulteress. Or even like that tax collector over there, that cootie guy over there. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes to all that I get. I pay tithes of all that I get. Oh, Lord, I'm the man. I do so much good, and I'm not like that bum John. Oh, and I ain't nothing like Chuck. I am so righteous. I fast. I tithe. I sit on the first pew, and that's why I am not a pew or whatever. I am so righteous. And then verse 13, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man will, went to his house justified why, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be what? And he who humbles himself will be exalted. The one man is prideful, the other man is humble. God doesn't answer the prayers of prideful people. He, under, he, he answers the prayers of humble people. Look at 1 Timothy. The, the thing is, folks, is that we, we really don't have anything to be prideful about. We need the help of God every day of our life. The instruction of Jesus is to live each day, one day at a time. Because that's, that's about all that we can handle. Actually, we can't even handle living one day at a time. That's why he said, when you pray, say, give us this day our daily bread. And some of us find that we need to pray that prayer many times during the day. We need the help of God. You know, I, I was uh, listening, I was in a meeting the other day, and uh, a fellow said, there's two, day, there's, two days of the week, there's two days of the week that you should never think about so that you can stay humble. Uh, that's yesterday and tomorrow. You just need to think about today. You can get through today being dependent on God. You, you, if, you, if you get all lost in yesterday and, and guilt and condemnation and, and dreaming and all that nonsense and, and you reflect all about the future and your plans and, all the, and you're fearful and you're all that stuff about the... Just all you... Listen, humility is, humility is lined up with reality. Your reality is you can't do very much. Actually, your reality is worse than that. You can't do anything successfully without the help of God. Okay, you don't believe me. That's all right. Go out and prove it to yourself. Ignore God, live your own life, and then when you're 70 years old, drop dead and have a miserable life because that's what you'll get. If you're smart, you'll understand that today... You need the help of God. You need the help of God today. Ask for it. Seek and knock and he will give it to you in everything. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is this great uh, section that we, we certainly want to look at today, this week. First of all, men, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and giving of thanks be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, so that we may lead a, a quiet, a tranquil and quiet life in godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between, also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus 
who gave himself as a ransom for all and testimony given to at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I'm telling the truth, I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. In the context of, of verses 4 through 7 are so important, God's desire wanting all men to be saved. We have in verse 1 that prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and for all that are in authority so that we may lead a peaceful or tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And again in verse 8, Therefore I want all men, every place, to pray lifting up holy hands without raft and dissension. How important it is for us to pray all the time, especially during this time. As a citizen of the United States, I, I endeavor to be a good citizen. I endeavor to do what my Lord teaches me to do, which is to obey the laws of the land as they don't contradict the laws of God. I obey the laws of the land. I, try, I, I put on my seatbelt when I get in my car, not because I want to, but because it's a law and because the Word of God tells me to. And it's not breaking the Word of God for me to wear a seatbelt. So I, I try to be a good citizen. I try to obey the laws of the land. You matter as a son of God. Your presence matters. You matter. Where you go at work, you matter. Where you go at school matters. Where you, where you are everywhere matters if you're standing for God. And if you're not standing for God, you're still influencing the world around you. So take a stand. Do what's right. Pray. Pray. 